Hey guys, this is your host Dave Mellon with Valor Fire Training and today I wanted to talk to you about your OODA loop. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you've come to the right place. The OODA loop is a acronym that was designed by a military strategist named John Boyd. He was an Air Force colonel and it was applied to aerial combat operations. So John Boyd came up with this concept that if two aircraft were engaged in combat, they had to come through this uh, decision-making process and whoever got through the fastest was going to win. So it was really revolutionary at the time and it still is revolutionary today for law enforcement, military, and firefighting. Um, but it's probably one of the least talked about things in fire training. So I wanted to take a second, kind of explain what it is, how we use it, and uh, give you some tips on how you can apply it for your department with your trainings. So the whole acronym stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. So if you think about a fighter pilot, they're flying through the air, there's an enemy combatant in another airplane, they have to observe that there's an enemy. Then they have to orient themselves to where their plane is compared to where the enemy's plane is. Then they have to decide what the best action is going to be. Am I going to break right? Am I going to break left? Am I going to pull a, a, a turn? Uh, you know, and so as they are making that decision, then they have to make the actual act of doing it. So then we get to the act. And, you know, there's a lot of different moving parts to this, but very simply put, you already do this hundreds of times a day. If you're driving down the highway and you're going to work or you're going home and a car swerves into your lane, you observe that there's a car coming into your lane. You have to orient yourself. So a lot of us will take a second to look in the left mirror, the rear view mirror and the right mirror. And we're trying to decide where can I go and not get in an accident. Then I have to decide, okay, I got a car to my left, a car to my right, nothing behind me. I have to slam on my brakes. So when you actually slam on your brakes, you have made it completely through that cycle of the OODA loop. For the people that don't make it through the OODA loop very fast, you're going to get in a wreck. For the people that do get through the OODA loop fast, uh, you're going to avoid that near miss accident. Uh, and you're going to sit there and go, holy crap, I almost got in an accident. So when we talk about it in the military, law enforcement, and fire sense, this applies a lot to our jobs and how we function. Uh, and we use it a lot in our training scenarios because firefighters are used to going through the same exact training scenario every single time. So if we're going to do a live fire scenario, the hose line's already stretched to the door. All they have to do is walk up. They open up the door. They go in. They turn right. They go 10 feet down the hallway. They turn left. There's the fire. We put it out. We slap hands, give high fives, and we're done. So there's really no OODA loop to be had with that. There's no decision-making process. We're already accustomed to how we're going to do it. So when we change things up and when we put blocks in the path of the norm, this is creating an OODA loop that they have to go through. And so for me, uh, when I learned about this, and, and this isn't something that I've known since day one, this is something that I actually just learned a few years ago. Uh, and as a instructor, I was like, oh, this is golden. This is perfect. I can use this to literally flip people's minds upside down. I mean, we're, we're going to mess with people left and right. And so what we do, and we're really, really well known for it, and we enjoy doing it. Uh, you know, we try to throw as many roadblocks as we comfortably can into a scenario to make people go through this OODA loop process. And a lot of times they don't even realize that they're doing it. So for me, one of the things that I enjoy the most, uh, and I'm sure that there's probably pictures floating around somewhere of this, but I will in a theatrically smoke filled building, uh, I will strip down to my underwear and socks, or if the pavement's hot, I'll put on flip flops. And I will come running out of the building in my underwear and I will run right up to the company officer or any firefighter that I can find first. And I grab them and start screaming frantically in English, Spanish, whatever language I can come up with. Uh, and I will learn the sentences that I need to know to be able to scream at them that my family is trapped inside. So there's a couple things that happen. One, you're going to get people that are going to just vapor lock. They just freeze up because they have never been exposed to that. They don't know what to do. They observed it, they oriented, they're looking around and you can see their eyes moving, but they can't get past that decide. They just can't come up with anything to do. Um, then you're going to get people who observe, orient, they make a decision, but maybe it's not the desired decision that you wanted. Um, one of the ones that stands out to me, we had a guy that was in the training scenario. Uh, I was screaming at him in Spanish and he pulled out his phone and tried to use Google Translate to have a conversation with me. Well, when you're on a fire scene and you have loud trucks and sirens and air horns and people yelling, Google Translate doesn't work, so don't try. 
Um, but that was his best go-to uh, decision. And so after he did that, we were like, okay, did it work? No. Okay, well, what would have been a better decision? Well, maybe there's somebody on scene who does speak Spanish. Um, and so the next scenario that he was involved in, we did the same thing. It was somebody that came around from the back of the building. They were screaming in Spanish. And he got on the radio and said, hey, I have a Spanish-speaking victim here. I need somebody who speaks Spanish. And lo and behold, one of our instructors was like, hey, I'm fluent in Spanish. What do you need? Hey, find out what this guy's saying. Well, he's screaming that his daughter and his wife are trapped on the second floor in the back bedroom. Well, that's really important information that we need to have. So that observe, orient, decide, and act can be applied in a lot of different ways. Uh, and so for a lot of training companies out there that are doing this, uh, you know, Brothers in Battle is really known for throwing baby mannequins out of windows. If you've watched the videos, it never fails the first couple times that baby smacks the concrete. I mean, it just happens. The baby falls, hits the concrete, and everybody goes as they're backing away, right? Well, as you work with people on that OODA loop, you watch that process. They observed that baby coming out of the window. They oriented themselves. They turned towards the baby flying out of the window, but they couldn't get through the decide phase before the baby hit the concrete. Well, as they work on it and as they move through that process, now you see people dropping tools, dropping ladders, dropping radios, dropping whatever they need to drop, and they catch that baby every single time. So when we make people be uncomfortable and work through that process, we can actually get them to make better decisions. And that's why I love the OODA loop. I think it's so imperative that we use it in our training uh, scenarios. And I don't think a lot of people are. So uh, you, you can definitely Google it. Uh, if you Google OODA loop, O-O-D-A uh, loop, you can find it. You can also uh, Google John Boyd, John common spelling, B as in boy, O-Y-D. Uh, and it'll pull up a lot of this information. There's, there's ways to incorporate it into all sorts of different training. Uh, and so what we have found is that a lot of firefighters who maybe would have vapor locked or wouldn't have made a desirable decision, if you work on them with the OODA loop and if you get them comfortable being uncomfortable and getting hung up in those scenarios, as long as you give them the, the positive reinforcement and walk them through the steps and the process and tell them the better option or maybe a different option that they can use, it expands the Rolodex. So now instead of looking at three flashcards, they have a whole Rolodex to go through in their mind. The next problem is we have to make sure that they can go through that Rolodex fast enough. So one of the things that I talk about a lot when we're doing OODA loop training um, is that I want them to focus in on the things that they've done with the scenario at hand. So for me, when I'm going on a structure fire, I'm going through the Rolodex of everything that I've experienced with structure fires. Um, not to say that you can't have a bus of people run into a you know supermarket and catch on fire, um, but if we're going to a vehicle extrication, I'm thinking extrication stuff in my Rolodex. If we're going to a medical call, I'm thinking about the medical stuff. So what we've done is we've taken this huge Rolodex with all these experiences and we shrink it down to just whatever the, the, the scenario is. And it kind of helps free up a lot of that space. Um, and for some of those computer nerds out there like me, uh, you're freeing up the RAM. So you're freeing up RAM memory to be able to process things a little bit faster. If you clog that RAM memory in your computer, your phone, or any of your devices down, your device runs really, really, really slow. So again, you know, using this OODA loop principle, we can train people to get through that process faster. And if you don't think that it's important, if you don't see the benefit of it in the fire service side, I'll tell you how law enforcement uses it. Uh, and I've talked to a lot of friends of mine who are in law enforcement who have used this, uh, and it's training that they've gone through. A law enforcement officer is standing on scene with a subject, and that subject starts reaching into their waistband. They have to observe that that subject is doing something they shouldn't be doing. Then they have to orient themselves to where that subject is. Do I have time to draw my service weapon? Do I have to hide behind something? Should I just tackle them and grab their hand to get it away from whatever they're trying to reach for? Then they have to decide, I'm going to do this act. And then they have to actually do it. And so a lot of times, law enforcement officers are already behind the eight ball, just like we are. If somebody's going to punch a police officer or stab a police officer or shoot a police officer, they're at the advantage because they know what's about to happen. The police officers don't. Just like with us on a fire scene, if somebody is about to bust out of a door and come scream at you in Spanish, they know that they're about to do that. You have no idea what's coming. So because they have worked so hard on the OODA loop and trained with all those different scenarios, um, they become very fast at making those decisions. And that's where you'll see a lot of law enforcement officers instinctively 
as somebody reaches or starts pulling their hand out, they instinctively will put their hand out and hit them as they're drawing their service weapon and bringing it up. It's because they know that if they can hit that person and disorient them for a second or shine a flashlight in their eyes, that's going to give them a second to reset the subject's OODA loop, and now they're at the disadvantage. So even though we're not combating people necessarily, um, we can t use that OODA loop to really move into a realm where we're able to make better decisions and we're able to make them faster. So if you're in a department that's doing training but you're not using the OODA loop, look it up, try it. I guarantee you, you will see results with it. Um, it is amazing at how it works. Uh, we've used it in almost every single scenario. No matter what training we're doing, we try to implement some sort of OODA loop decision-making process into it. If you're in a department that doesn't train as much, this is something that you can sit down with your crew and you can talk to them and say, hey, I learned about this OODA loop thing, let's talk about it. And you can replicate these things during dinner, you can replicate them during exercise, you can replicate them during all sorts of different activities. It doesn't have to be training. You can pop out from behind a corner and say, hey, what about this and this and this and this? Give me an answer. And it's gonna take them a second to observe, orient, then they're gonna to have to think about the answer and then they're gonna to have to get back to you. As you start doing things like that, it makes them process stuff a little bit faster. It's not as good as doing a hands-on scenario, it's not as good as doing a fire ground scenario, but it's something. And so, like I said, you know, we've talked about this before. If you don't train, uh, you know, at least every so often, um, you're not doing yourself any favors. and You're not doing the public any favors either. So I'm never going to tell you that you need to go out there and train for 24 or 23 hours out of a 24 hour day. But I will tell you that you need to train often and you need to train hard. So until the next time we talk, take care, be safe, work on your OODA loop, and we'll talk to you soon.